This is Dr. Good. I'll be speaking about schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Um, schizophrenia comes from the word meaning split mind. It should not be confused with multiple personality disorder. Um, it's not really a split of the mind. In truth, it's actually a split between the intellect and the emotions. Um, psychosis is a significant loss of contact with reality. Okay, and here we see uh, a portrayal of John Nash um, from the movie Beautiful Mind. Um, a very famous schizophrenic who won the Nobel Peace Prize, I believe. John Nash, a famous mathematician. Um, okay, so here we're going to start with a few of the aspects of schizophrenia. Um, we're going to start with delusions, hallucinations, uh, disorganized speech and behavior, um, and we'll touch on catatonia, and then we'll get into subtypes. Okay. So first, delusions. A delusion is an erroneous belief um, that is fixed and firmly held despite clear contradictory evidence. Okay. It's a disturbance in the content of the thought. It's counterfactual. In other words, it's not true. Um, we can have all sorts of different delusions. Delusions of persecution, delusions of grandeur, for instance. Um, we'll mention here delusions of reference. Um, so, it's a belief that one's thoughts, feelings, or actions are being controlled externally, often. Uh, uh, made feelings or impulses. It's a belief that one's private thoughts are being broadcast indiscriminately to others. And this is called thought broadcasting. Okay, first it's called made feelings or impulses, and this is called thought broadcasting. Um, thirdly, a belief that thoughts are being inserted into one's brain by external agencies. That's called thought insertion. A belief in an agency is just uh, outside force. A uh, belief that an external agency has robbed one of one's thoughts. It's called thought withdrawal. Delusions of reference are where some neutral environmental event, like a TV show or a song on the radio, is believed to have a special and personal meaning intended only for the person. And we've noted um, things like that in the uh, in past chapters. Uh, others may have delusions, that, you know, ran, random delusions, that their organs have been removed, or one of them, or that their bowels don't work, things like that. Um, that they are the president of the United States, um, things like that. So, um, here's a clip from the movie, um, not a clip, uh, just a photo. Um, this guy does not exist in the movie, um, but yet John Nash sees him. This is called a hallucination. It's one type, and, and many of us think a hallucination is something you see that isn't there. I want you to expand your mind for a moment. Um, realize that a hallucination is any sensory experience of something that is not there. Okay? So smelling something that is not there. Seeing something, of course. Hearing something that is not there. Touching or feeling something um, that is not there. Sight, sound speech, smell, hearing, tasting. It's called a gustatory hallucination. Tasting something that didn't, isn't actually in your mouth. Um, hallucinations are a sensory experience that seem real to the person having it, but that occurs in the absence of any external perceptual stimulus. Now, do not get this confused with an illusion a misperception of a stimulus that actually exists. Um, this can occur in any sensory modality, auditory hearing, visual eyes, olfactory smelling, tactile touch, and gustatory taste. 
auditory hallucinations where hearing voices are the most common, 75% of patients with schizophrenia. Visual hallucinations are 15%. Patients may act on the hallucinations, do what the voices tell them to do, for instance. The voices may be friends, God, Satan, uh, sort of conversational voices, but often use rude and vulgar expletives or are critical. Some are pleasant and supportive. So people hear things, but the speech production centers in their minds are activated. People interpret their subconscious thought verbalizations as another voice external to their own. This is similar to subvocal speech. Okay. Here's a picture from the movie The Soloist. Um, and notice how, how this gentleman's dressed. Um, got some things that don't make sense here, right? Uh, I may not have picked the best, but this isn't just, um, well, I mean, you might think, well, he looks homeless. Yes. And I would say to that, that a lot of our homeless population is schizophrenic. Notice the disorganized nature, or the, the fact that it's not logical what he's wearing. He's in an urban environment, he's wearing camo, he's wearing multiple layers, he's wearing some sort of head gear. Um, of course he's unshaven, but you know, it's November, right? Um, uh, anyway, you, you get the idea um, that we'll often see people strangely dressed. That is a clue. That is not a determination. Um, so, disorganized speech or behavior, uh, the external manifestation of a disorder in thought form. It fails to make sense, despite seeming to conform to the semantic and syntactic rules governing verbal communication. In other words, it's incoherent speech. The words and word combinations sound communicative. They sound like sentences, but the listener is left with little or no understanding of the point the speaker is trying to make. Sometimes they make up words, and those are called neologisms. Observers note that the person is not themselves anymore. Um, it impairs their daily functioning. And focusing a little more on behavior than speech, um, they, they have uh, personal hygiene issues, profound disregard for personal safety and health, grossly disorganized behavior may be silly or unusual dress, wearing an overcoat, scarf, and gloves on a hot summer day. Um, these are uh, very, very sad, and I will just point out schizophrenia is possibly the most debilitating uh, illness that a person can have um, you know throughout life at least um, it's it's very um, sad onset is normally uh, 18 to 25 years of age uh, we'll talk a little more about it um, catatonia and here I pulled a picture from the movie awakenings um, couple famous people in it. Uh, catatonia shows a virtual absence of all movement and speech and is in a catatonic stupor. Uh, may hold an unusual posture for an extended period of time without seeing seeming without any seeming discomfort. Uh, so they don't appear to be uncomfortable. Um, when we talk about positive and negative symptoms um, we're, we're not talking about good or bad. We're talking about the presence or absence of things. Positive symptoms are those that reflect an excess or distortion in a normal repertoire of behavior and experience, such as delusions and hallucinations. Negative symptoms reflect an absence or deficit of behaviors that are normally present. So, what would flat or blunted emotional expressiveness be? It would be a negative symptom. Alogia, very little speech. That is negative symptoms. And avolition, of course, another negative symptom. No ability to initiate or persist in goal-directed activities. 
may stare into space or watch TV with little interest in any outside work or social activity, may appear emotionless but still experience emotion. So, of course, there are a lot of negative symptoms involved. Now, one thing that's important when we when we get into schizophrenia is that the, the subtypes are important. Um, so we talk about schizophrenia generally, and then we talk about the subtypes. The first being the paranoid type. Um, we might also mention delusions of grandeur, disorganized type, catatonic type, undifferentiated type, and residual type. Um, so, um, let me touch on each of these. I believe um, I'm just going to speak to you about these um, so there's not a lot of text so we'll be on this slide for a bit um, you may want to take a break first uh, paranoid type is a has a history of increasing suspiciousness and of se severe difficulties in interpersonal relationships absurd and illogical ideas and beliefs that are often highly elaborated and organized into it a coherent the delusional framework. Uh, they may also have persecut persecutory delusions. Now, when I wrote delusions of grandeur here, it really doesn't fit um, except as another type of delusion. It's not a subtype of schizophrenia. Delusions of grandeur is just something I wanted to touch on. Sometimes it uh, gives the justifications for their persecutory delusion. Um, so these delusions may go together. D grandeur and persecution if I'm important, that's why I'm being uh, persecuted. Um, the disorganized type usually occurs at an earlier age and has a gradual, insidious onset characterized by disorganized speech, disorganized behavior, and flat or inappropriate affect. These people are reclusive and preoccupied with fantasies. Emotional indifference and infantile behavior often have a silly smile and inappropriate shallow laughter after little or no provocation. Uh, speech is difficult to understand and may include baby talk or childish giggling and repetitious use of similar sounding words, maybe some rhyming. Hallucinations and delusions in this subtype are not organized as they are with the paranoid type and may not be able to take care of themselves and or perform routine tasks going to have probably m peculiar mannerisms and other bizarre forms of behavior. Odd facial um, grimaces, talking and gesturing to themselves, or sudden inexplicable laughter and weeping. Okay, the catatonic, catatonic type, I'm sorry. Um, these people have pronounced motor signs, and this is from the, think of this. Catatonic, catatonic type, and of course I don't believe he had schizophrenia. Catatonia is not schizophrenia specific, but catatonia does sometimes come with schizophrenia. Uh, has pronounced motor signs either of an excited or a stuporous type. Um, note that sometimes a uh, motor signs that are hyper excited may seem like like what a seizure would do. If if your hand was shaking fast enough, it would appear to be still. Okay? So, excited or stuporous. Um, highly suggestible and will automatically obey commands and imitate the actions of others. That's called echopraxia or echopraxia. They may mimic their phrases. That's a, called echolalia. They resist changing position become mute, resist feeding, resist all requests. Sudden changes from stupor to excitement, uh, the pressure of activity, they may be violent like mania, they may pace rapidly, talk or shout incoherently, indulge in public sexual activities, attempt self-mutilation or suicide, and impulsively attack or kill others. Um, the lack of movement for them may be actually a sense of control. 
Now the undifferentiated type, I just put there, it just means that it doesn't fit into, into any specific category. Uh, the residual type, however, uh, is used for people who have suffered at least one episode of schizophrenia, but do not now show any prominent positive symptoms such as hallucinations, delusions, or disorganized speech or behavior. Mostly going to show just negative symptoms, that flat affect. For instance. Okay, so other psychotic disorders here. We have a famous girl from the internet um, who says scary things. Um, schizoaffective disorder um, it involves features of schizophrenia and severe mood disorder has psychotic symptoms that meet criteria for schizophrenia, but also has marked changes in mood for a substantial amount of time. They can be bipolar or unipolar type of schizoaffective disorder. Schizophreniform disorder is a schizophrenia-like psychosis that um, lasts at least a month, but does not last for six months and does not warrant a schizophrenia diagnosis. Uh, delusional disorder hold beliefs that are considered completely false and absurd by those around them uh, may otherwise behave normally no behavioral disorganization and performance deficiencies erotomania uh, the delusion involves great love of a person usually of a higher status common among women who stalk uh, brief psychotic disorder is a sudden onset of psychotic symptoms or grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. Uh, they have great turmoil, but only last a few days. It's often triggered by stress. Note the word brief. Uh, shared psychotic disorder. Um, this comes from the French name uh, folie à deux. Uh, the delusion that develops in someone who has a very close relationship with another person who is delusional. Over time, they believe in the same, quote, shared delusion. This can spread to whole families um, through what we call contagion of thought. Now, with regard to risks and causes, um, you see some of the genetic uh, influences here. Um, genetics, um, it runs in families, share genes and environments, um, of course, so, so it can be both. Genes equal about 25% of the cause. Um, they may have communicative deviance uh, or poor communication and or a dysfunctional family system that plays a large role in activating a vulnerability for schizophrenia. Linkage analysis of chromosomes it's focused on candidate genes, thought to play a role, but uh, to date there are no major findings. Um, scientists also study endophenotypes, um, discrete, stable, and measurable traits that are thought to be under genetic control. There's increased risk if the mother has flu during uh, the fourth to seventh month of gestation, which is pregnancy. Um, this disrupts neural development of the fetus. Also, a complicated pregnancy or birth or, or delivery um, can affect the oxygen supply to the baby. Um, nutritional deficiency in utero and as babies and children may also play a role. Epigenetics may turn on or off schizophrenia genes due to environmental conditions, such as uh, famine, for instance. A vulnerability may be due to a brain lesion uh, like an error, or a scar, or a general problem during early development. Signs of motor abnormalities as early as age two in pre-schizophrenics, uh, especially uh, attention problems. Early signs are called prodromal, P-R-O-D-R-O-M-A-L. They may also have some physiological issues. Um, enlarged ventricles in the brain means a deficit in the amount of brain tissue. Progressive loss of brain tissue, that's degenerative, across the lifespan after onset. Low frontal lobe activation, 
immunocompromised amygdala, hippocampus, and temporal lobes. Neural or gene migration is last in the left frontal cortex and may be most vulnerable. They may have reduced volume of the thalamus, which takes in all the sensory input. They may have missing inhibitory intraneurons that may influence excitatory responses. Um, so they can't handle normal levels of stress. Um, I think I wanted to mention here before we moved on, uh, dopamine. Dopamine is the most important neurotransmitter implicated in schizophrenia. Uh, the dopamine hypothesis has to do with drugs that block dopamine receptors helped patients. Amphetamines, which increase dopamine, are tied to schizophrenic activity. Clinical studies showed dopamine increased vulnerability for psychosis. Dopamine balance may allow us to attend properly to the right environmental cues and information. And so we might have a dopamine imbalance among these individuals. They may begin to pay attention to background environmental information. The hum of the refrigerator sounds like a voice. So they're attending to the to the wrong environmental stimuli. Maybe too much dopamine in the synapse or the receptor neuron is overly sensitive to dopamine, which is probably more likely. Um, increased size of dopamine receptor neurons or D2 neurons. And we have um, dopamine and then we have glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter. Deficiency may increase schizophrenia. Um, and this is, has been studied with PCP and ketamine studies. A lack of glutamate may also cause subtle, gradual brain damage. Dopamine increases are associated with glutamate decreases. Okay, so notice that they're interrelated. Now, into neurocognition. If you need to, you can, um, I'll try to provide these slides and you can uh, zoom in to read this a little more easily. Um, neurocognition um, problems with working memory are a key issue. Difficulty tracking a moving target visually. Uh, poor P50 suppression among schizophrenics. Responding to, say, two clicks. Um, they don't habituate to the second click, but respond to the second click in close succession just as much as the first click. Overall difficulty with the active allocation of attentional resources. Then we have what's called EE, expressed emotion. It's a measure of the family environment that is based on how a family member speaks about the patient during a private interview with a researcher. Is it criticism, hostility, uh, or is it this this other thing, EOI, or in emotional over-involvement. In addition to communicative uh, deviance, these three emotional stimuli may exacerbate the vulnerability for schizophrenia. EE predicts relapse. Okay, Schizophrenics are highly stress sensitive. Cortisol is released when we are stressed, affects the levels of dopamine and glutamate. Urban environments are almost three times more likely, possibly due to stress and social adversity, um, to lead to uh, schizophrenia. Uh, cannabis also increases susceptibility by six times as much, especially if um, used earlier in life during the pre-development or developmental years. Uh, cannabis use is two times that of the general population among schizophrenics. Uh, cannabis accelerates schizophrenic development um, and increases brain damage. Um, okay, so there are obviously some, some medicines that have been developed. Uh, the first generation antipsychotics are medications like Thorazine and Haldol, sometimes referred to as neuroleptics, um, which means to seize the neuron. It's meant to help patients uh, through dopamine antagonists. Uh, they work best with the positive symptoms that a schizophrenic might have. But they may cause drowsiness, dry mouth, and weight gain. Um, they may also have EPS, or extrapyramidal side effects. Involuntary movement abnormalities, such as spasms, spasms, rigidity, or shaking. They may develop tardive dyskinesia over time, which is a marked involuntary movement of the lips, 
and tongues, hands, and neck. Okay. So obviously, um, whenever a medicine or a group of medicines is causing a lot of side effects, um, there's a lot of money to be made. Um, but there's also, you know, some some ethical and, and moral reasons, health reasons, to try to um, create a, a better uh, type of medicine, and that's what they did uh, with the second generation antipsychotics. Uh, think of Chlorazil, Zyprexa, Risperdal, Seroquel, um, Geodon, even Abilify. Um, there's far fewer extra pyramidal side effects. So it alleviates both positive and negative symptoms. It blocks broader range of receptors, um, but drowsiness and weight gain are still common. Um, here you see a picture from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where you have some schizophrenics, of course. Um, so when treating um, these disorders like schizophrenia, family therapy seeks to decrease um, EE. Case management um, is used to check in on patients after hospital release and connect them with services. Social skills training may be used um, to increase functional outcome, make friends, keep a job, live independently. And they're taught to make eye contact, speak in a normal volume, take turns in conversation. Cognitive remediation um, is used to help patients improve some of their neurocognitive deficits improve attention, memory, and executive functioning skills. It is also shown to improve social functioning. CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy um, is used to examine uh, the validity of hallucinations and delusions uh, leading to decreased psychosis. Uh, supportive counseling was especially helpful uh, being uh, friendly and befriending uh, the client or the patient. Uh, individual treatment, um, for instance, John Nash um, in the movie A Beautiful Mind received psychodynamic therapy. It's now replaced with personal therapy, which is a non-psychodynamic approach that equips patients with a broad range of coping techniques and skills. And that is the end. Um, any questions can be directed um, to me at joel.gooden at athens.edu that's j-o-e-l dot g-o-o-d-i-n at a-t-h-e-n-s dot e-d-u hope you all have a wonderful evening hope you enjoyed this group of lectures thank you very much bye bye